They say you should never judge a book by its cover, but if I see a game with cover art that goes absolutely insanely hard, I tend to end up loving the game itself, and Halo is absolutely no exception. If you judged Halo games by the cover art, I'd say your expectations would be set pretty well. Over the years, Halo's box arts have become some of the most iconic imagery in all of gaming. Renowned, I would argue, more than just about any other franchise out there. And for good reason. I mean, there's just something so striking about them. They encapsulate the vibe and the tone of their respective games perfectly, while still looking adequately flashy to satisfy Microsoft's marketing team. But what if I told you that there's one cover art, arguably Halo's most iconic, that has a ton of secret lore behind it. Dark, clandestine lore that will forever change the way that you look at one of the most iconic pieces of Halo art ever made. Now, technically, every Halo cover art has a degree of very rough lore behind it. Typically, most of them just kind of hyper-stylize an event or a location that exists within the game. Halo Combat Evolves is a stylization seemingly of the level Halo. Halo 3's is a hyper-stylized shot of Chief in Voy. ODST's is Rookie roaming the rainy streets of New Mombasa. Reach. Well, Reaches is more of a hero shot than anything, and the same kind of goes for Halo Wars 1 and Halo Wars 2. These are more so exceptions. Halo 4's is a stylized shot of Chief in the wreckage of the Dawn. Halo 5's is an Omega stylized shot of Chief and Locke's face off. And Infinite is a stylized shot of Chief exploring Zeta Halo. Not to point out the ridiculously obvious. But you may have noticed that I skipped over the cover art of the greatest video game that humanity has ever created. And well, there's a reason for that. Halo 2's cover art goes beyond stylization. It's an actual in-universe photograph with a clandestine backstory. And to uncover said backstory, we have to go back through the life and career of a man named Ben Giroux. Benjamin Giroux was a war journalist in the 2500s. However, the term war journalist is used rather strenuously in this case. He was technically freelance, but his primary bankroller was none other than the Office of Naval Intelligence, so you can probably see where this one's going. Ben's first major entry in the universe was in the graphic novel released by Bungie in 2006. The story, Second Sunrise Over New Mombasa, told the story of how Ben escaped the Covenant's invasion of Mombasa, armed with a significant discovery. But it also revealed much of the work that he'd done prior to and also during Earth's invasion. Because of the nature of his employer, Ben wasn't so much a journalist as he was a propagandist. He controlled, edited, and manipulated raw feeds from remote news cameras across the galaxy to reproduce and reformat the content into what he regarded as a digestible format, one more suitable for public consumption. Ben and his fellow propagandists created the news, spinning public attitude towards the productive and the confident and away from the fear and the panic. And for doing so, they were well and truly securing the bag. But to him, it seemed relatively harmless because he was working on Earth and the war was hundreds of light years away. It never seemed as though it would ever reach Earth. Until it did. Just like I never thought I'd hit 600,000 subscribers until you saw how close I was and decided to hit subscribe to help me hit such a milestone. Thank you very much. As the Covenant annihilated colonies closer and closer to Earth, Ben's job started getting harder. A positive picture was getting harder and harder to paint, and yet Oni and the UNSC were putting more pressure on him to do so because of how desperate things were getting. They started getting even more overbearing, breathing down his neck, dictating what he could and couldn't do, how to frame a picture or a clip to fit their specific parameters. Ben considered himself an artist, and so this got increasingly frustrating until it all came to a head when the Covenant reached Earth and the propaganda wore off. During the invasion, however, Ben recorded a groundbreaking discovery. A clip of an elite saying, we need to clear this area before we can secure access to the Ark. The first mention of the Ark that humanity had ever witnessed. And so, because of this, he was hurried out of the city by the Marines, making it to the docks where the civilians were evacuating, but there wasn't enough room on the ships. And so, to secure the information safety, 
He gave a girl the recording and she made it out safe with the recording. This was Ben's first run in with actual danger and he got to experience firsthand what happens when the reality of a situation overpowers the propaganda. Now then, quick interlude. So you may have seen these very cool warlocks. Uh, yep, those bad boys right there in the background of the last couple of videos. And well, they're courtesy of today's sponsor, Displate. Displate is a one of a kind metal poster designed to capture your passions with tons of art from licensed and branded shops, as well as 40,000 unique artists. With over 1.3 million designs, you can get just about anything. I honestly love Displate long before I ever did a sponsor for them. I had a bunch of Displates and I love them, but for the sake of this video, I decided to refresh my collection. Firstly, I picked up this bad boy, which is my favorite piece of Halo art of all time ever, done way back for Halo 2 by the legendary Craig Mullins who did a ton of art for Halo and Marathon and other Bungie games as well. But I pushed the boat out a little bit this time and went for some other stuff as well. So I got this beautiful Dark Souls bonfire art that just looks so good in a dimly lit room. And then this super nostalgic Baradur promotional art that was done for the Fellowship of the Ring way back in the day. One of the best things about Displate is how easy they are to mount as well, thanks to their magnet mounting system, which allows you to not only mount them easily, but also easily swap them out if you want to without any hassle. So if you want some really sick wall art for Halo or Dark Souls or RuneScape or Elden Ring or Lord of the Rings or just about anything else, head on over to the link in the description and make sure to use code experience at checkout. You get 25% off orders with one displate and 35% off orders with two or more. Cheers displate, back to the Onibiz. But Ben's, Onis, and likely the Halo universe's most iconic piece of propaganda was born from this very conflict. On that fateful day in New Mombasa, Ben took this photograph. But this isn't the original. It didn't always look like this. This was the original that was taken that day that was sent to Oni, and this is what they sent back, annotated with all the revisions that Ben had to make to the image so it could be used as propaganda. Even when the enemy had breached humanity's front door, Oni was still dedicated to controlling hysteria and panic, and upholding the positive, victory fueled image of the war that they'd spent years conjuring up. The image that was sadly extremely detached from reality. You can see in the only annotated picture how much of a squeaky clean image of the war that they were trying to paint, even in the most desperate of times. Cropping out Regret's carrier, for example, cropping out the dead marine, reducing the amount of banshees in the sky, de-emphasizing explosions, and even cleaning up Chief's armor. We don't know for sure how much this image was circulated in universe, but given that Oni had spent god knows how long building the Spartans up to be these mythical, invincible super soldiers who simply could not die, I think it's fair to say that this photograph was essentially the 26th century equivalent of Uncle Sam. And so, Halo 2's cover art is in fact one of the greatest pieces of propaganda that humanity has ever conjured up. I do wonder what the point of propaganda was at this point in the war though. When it was happening on a TV screen, hundreds of light years away on the other side of the galaxy, I get it. You don't want populations at the heart of human space falling into mass hysteria because of something that, at least directly, isn't affecting them yet. That's just gonna cause massive civil unrest that in turn is gonna end up eating up tons of UNSC resources and time, which are two very precious resources that the top brass knew that they didn't have. But when the Covenant are quite literally invading Earth, you can't hide from the reality of it anymore. Any propaganda that you put out is just instantly nullified the second somebody goes out into their garden, looks up into the sky, and sees a gigantic Covenant carrier floating above them. But regardless of the rather questionable efficacy of it later on in the war, propaganda was one of Oni's many clandestine specialties, and it was all courtesy of a specific division within the office, Oni Section 2. Oni Section 2 is the division of Oni responsible for controlling external communication and public morale. During the Human Covenant War, their main priority was controlling the flow of information about the Covenant and the state of the war, ensuring that general populations retained a positive outlook and never descended into fear-fueled hysteria. However, I would argue that all this propaganda was quite dangerous in fact, even counteractive to a degree. The inner colonies, especially Earth, had no idea how close the Covenant actually were until it was too late. 
Regardless, Benjiro's work was a prime example of Section 2's capabilities. Doctoring footage, editing images, and altering news stories about wars, replacing blood and retreat with sacrifice and strategic withdrawal, ensuring that if troopers were ever shown hurt, it was made aware that they were being carried off on the stretchers to safety and honours, having saved their platoon in an act of raw, inspiring heroism. You know, come to think of it, Section 2 actually operate quite similarly to the Patriot AI in Metal Gear Solid 2, controlling the flow of information and creating context around said information to, as they believe, further humanity by preventing any social unrest that could damage the war effort. Right. You seem to think that our plan is one of censorship. Are you telling me it's not? You're being silly. What we propose to do is not to control content, but to create context. You know, whenever I think of Only Section 2, I kind of can't help but think of both the Patriot AI and, in particular, Corrupted Colonel Campbell as almost their personification. And speaking of controlling the flow of information and leaking whatever truths suit them, Section 2's greatest leak pertains to the Spartans. So, the Spartan 2 program, and the Spartans in general, were, for incredibly obvious reasons, likely the most classified military project in known and unknown history. However, desperate times call for desperate measures. As the Covenant War worsened, rumour began to spread throughout UNSC fleets about the existence of Spartans, propping them up as creatures of myth and legend. This mythical status made the Spartans perfect beacons of hope and morale, to resources which were rapidly dwindling, and so Section 2 played into that, disseminating more information to uphold their mythical status before eventually going entirely public with them. Why? To boost morale. They'll boost the legend of the Spartan. If the war goes as projected with the Covenant, we will certainly need drastic measures to maintain confidence among the rank and file. It didn't even matter if the Spartans were dead. All that mattered was that they were no longer a secret. Enter Only Directive 930. So, if you're familiar with the term, Spartans never die, they're just missing in action, then, well, you're familiar with Only Directive 930. It reads, To maintain morale among the forces of the UNSC, any Spartan casualties are to be listed as missing in action, MIA, or wounded in action, WIA, but never killed in action, KIA. Directive 930 was devised after the Spartan 2 program was made public information to continue to uphold their mythical status now that they had trillions of eyes on them. Because they were now a commonly known thing, their deaths would become common information as well. And what good are inhuman legends leading the charge against extinction if they're mortal? So, only simply stop the Spartans from dying, at least within the public consciousness. As long as the public and lower ranking troopers were never aware that their heroes were in fact as mortal as they were, they could still be used as an infinite source of morale. However, there is no greater example of only Section 2's extremely shady doings than what they ultimately did to Ben Jiro. Following his escape from Mombasa, Ben went under the radar for a few years, no longer working for Oni, until 2558 when he re-entered the fold. He got a rather surprise communique from the senior communications director within Only Section 2, Michael Sullivan. The office were putting together a campaign around the Master Chief, complete with full access to people from Chief's past, exclusive interviews with them, and a ton more exclusive details. And given Ben's prior experience working propaganda with John, they thought that he was the perfect journalist turned propagandist for profit for the job. They already had interviews with a bunch of key people from John's past lined up, and Ben didn't even need to do any camera work or photo work for them. It was just a case of conducting interviews and putting together what seemed like a puff piece, and then getting paid a handsome sum of 120,000 credits for doing so. So, of course, Ben agreed. It seemed like easy money. But only a few interviews in, things started getting weird. Supposed key figures from Chief's childhood, who only had arranged interviews with, weren't who they were meant to be. Their stories were getting mixed up and inconsistencies and holes were starting to form. And very quickly, Ben started to realise that something else was going on here. There was more beneath the surface. 
So for the first time in quite a while, he once again put on his journalist hat. And while trying to avoid the watchful eye of Oni, he started to ask questions that he shouldn't. Very soon discovering that not only were almost all of the sources that Oni had provided for the piece paid actors, but also the truth behind Chief and the Spartans, what they really were. You see, when Section 2 went public with the Spartan 2s, it was done entirely for propaganda and, in turn, morale purposes. At no point was it ever done for transparency. So, of course, none of the finer details, shall we say, of the programme, such as all of the human rights violations and the extreme crimes against humanity, were ever made available to anybody outside of the absolute top clearance at Oni. At least, until now. Ben Jero was the only person outside of Oni Top Brass who knew the sickening reality of what the Spartans were. Abducted children forced into lethal, highly experimental biochemical augmentations and military conscription, replaced with flash clones unbeknownst to their parents who would quickly die of mysterious illnesses. Armed with this startling newfound knowledge, Ben went AWOL and started crafting the true story not the story that Oni wanted him to make, with full intent to go public and reveal the truth of the Master Chief to humanity. And it was going worryingly well. He even booked a slot on the popular ECB news channel on which he'd reveal the truth. It was going way too well. However, live on air, the interviewer, Charles Kessler, just so happened to have the perfect refutes for just about every accusation that Ben made against Oni, their cover-ups, their lies, their crimes against humanity, all of it, turning what should have been, by all intents and purposes, a slam-dunk interview and reveal into a complete disaster. It turned out that Oni were onto Ben the entire time. This was all their doing. They made him out to be nothing more than a nutjob conspiracy theorist in front of millions, possibly even billions of viewers, discrediting every single one of his well-researched claims and ensuring the confidentiality of the Spartan program remained intact. Shortly after the interview, Ben was arrested by Oni and taken to their midnight facility, the most secretive and high security prison in the galaxy. Half prison, half Oni black site, Midnight Facility is where individuals of all species are sent to disappear. It houses high-ranking ex-Covenant prophets, elite terrorists, turncoats, defectors, and many more highly dangerous individuals. Hidden within an asteroid with enough firepower to destroy an entire Covenant fleet, nobody gets in or out of Midnight alive without Oni see so. And that's where Ben Jiro will be kept for the rest of his days, for leaking the truth about humanity's saviors, the Spartans, in a brightly lit cube pumped full of sedative gas forevermore. And so, that's the secret lore behind Halo's most iconic cover art, and also quite a few other things as well. This video started out as one of those videos that focuses at first on like a central idea, that of course being the cover art of Halo 2 and its backstory, and then very quickly spiraled into something much greater. It really felt like a golden opportunity to finally cover Oni and their propaganda. So I hope you guys enjoyed, even if this video did kind of end up turning into going off on a tangent, the official video. To be fair, I do find quite a lot of the time, the most fun videos to make end up being made in such a way, so maybe I should go off on a tangent more often. But not now, because it's time to round the video out. So, I really hope you guys enjoyed. I want to give a massive thank you to all of my amazing patrons for the continued support over there, as per usual. And thank you all so much for watching, I really appreciate it. And I'll catch you all in the next one.